happy Friday. I hope you're all doing well. The sun is in the sky for now, so that's nice. Uh, I'm going to try and bring uh, extras of the uh, Suet reference sheet uh, each day, but it will be helpful if you can remember to bring yours to class, because it will be a, a useful reference for the next week or two. There's also a bonus uh, structured discussion assignment, boundary problems of socialism and liberalism up here, if anyone wants to get in on that. Um, one uh, kind of administrative thing, uh, you may have seen the emails, uh, the COVID team sent out about masks and so forth. They become optional as of Saturday, so they will become optional in this class. Please continue wearing a mask if you would prefer, um, but they will not be required. Uh, any questions on uh, that or the lab or any of the assembly stuff we've been looking at? All right, reminder that the check-in post uh, for the lab do 9 p.m. tonight. Lots of folks asking good questions uh, on the forum. So, plan for today, we're going to do some practice with the ideas uh, uh, about assembly that we've been talking about the last couple of times. And then we'll uh, start looking at how in assembly can we actually implement uh, conditional behavior, where we want programs that might do different things in different circumstances, something like an if statement, uh, and we'll start looking at that. Uh, to do this practice, we're going to do something that uh, is sort of an unusual activity, not something that you would kind of expect uh, to do quote unquote, in the real world, where uh, we're going to practice translating assembly into C code and also translating C into assembly code. Uh, these sorts of translations, uh, certainly C to assembly, something the compiler does, uh, but just like if you wanted to strengthen a particular muscle, you might go to a gym and do a fairly unusual uh, motion uh, to practice that specific, uh, to, to strengthen that specific muscle, we're doing sort of this uh, uh, unusual activity to strengthen our uh, facility with assembly. So, I have this function f, and I've given the, the signature for it here uh, in C. That's not a term you've heard before. Sort of the, the types of the parameters and the return type is called the signature of a function. Uh, and then I'm going to give the assembly, uh, that function an assembly. So here's the assembly for this function f, you know, four instructions. Uh, and this is an opportunity to talk about uh, some conventions in terms of how registers are used. Uh, and this is noted on the reference sheet in the table of registers. Uh, but registers that we see being used in this function have kind of conventional purposes for which they are used. Uh, RDI, when a function is called, the first argument to that function will be stored in RDI. When a function is called, if it has a second argument, the second argument to that function will be stored in RSI. When a function returns, you might notice that the return instruction doesn't take any operators. 
In C, we're used to seeing something like return x, right? We give a return value. In assembly, the red instruction does the return, the, the part of return that ends the function goes back to wherever the function was called. But the return value is whatever is stored in RAX when the function returns which means that whatever code called the function will just assume that the return value of that function, if it uses that return value, that it will find it in RAX. So you might notice that this function does change the value in RAX and then return, and whatever is in RAX will be you know, the long that's returned from the function. All right, questions on this assembly code. All right, I'd like you to work with your neighbors to come up with C code that is equivalent to this assembly code. I specifically say equivalent because there's many different versions of C code that would perform the same operation as this assembly code. There's almost never going to be kind of one version of the C code that matches exactly one version of the assembly, it's always going to be kind of a many-to-many -many relationship. So uh, we'll spend uh, uh, five minutes or, or more if, if we need it uh, coming up with a C code that matches this assembly. <laughs> All right, let's talk about how this would look in C. So have our same on I. Uh, someone give me what's uh, what's the first thing uh, your C version of this function did? Uh, initiate like a, a long um, tap, tap, like tap value. Uh, initialize it to? To I. All right, and how does that relate to the assembly? Uh, just using R S I to rack, which is what we're going to return later. Yeah, we have a register that we don't have a value in already, and we know RSI is the second argument, uh, and so we're just going to copy i to some temporary variable, which will be uh, stored in RAX. All right, what's what's the next step? All right. You uh, peer print one p and then add it to ten. So it's P reference P and I should fit that backwards. I think I would have equal to 10 plus something. Temp equals temp plus star P. All right, can you say how you got this from the assembly? Yeah, well, let um, the add Q line just adds um, the, the source value to this. Exactly. And why do we know that it's star p? Because the parentheses here is the register. Exactly. We're treating this register as a pointer to memory, dereferencing it to get whatever p points to, uh, and adding that to the destination and storing the result in the destination. All right, another step after this. Um, do you reference uh, do you reference p uh, equals temp? And you're getting that from the, the third line of assembly code here. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you how do you know that it's kind of star p on the left and temp on the right? Um, because Temp is the thing that's stored in RAX, and you're trying to move that to 
the memory address stored at RDI. So. Exactly. Yeah. Again, we have parentheses. We're dereferencing, and we're changing the value in memory there. Uh, I think we have one more line of C code. Return town. Yeah, we have a thing in RIX, and we return that. This makes sense. What are your questions on this? Marcus. Um, so in, instead of writing the like, star p, is it is it also feasible to like give the, the arrow to the value if you define value? Um, so the arrow operator is particularly when we have a pointer to a struct, because it's a way of dereferencing that pointer and then retrieving a specific field out of the struct. So uh, if so, when we have like a pointer to a node in lab zero, we could say dereference n dot value, or equivalently, we could say n arrow value. And kind of these are exactly the same operation, uh, just different syntax. Here, p is a pointer to a long. There aren't sort of fields inside a long. It's just eight bytes of a number. Uh, so we wouldn't use the arrow operator. That's only when we're getting a field from a struct. Does that make sense? Other questions? Okay. Um, so are any of the, the, what's it called, the like RDI and RSI and RIX, I forget what they're called, are any of them cleared after this function? Uh, they are not. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's kind of no automatic changing of register values. It kind of, um, with one, one exception that we'll talk about a little later when we talk about conditionals, um, but kind of any changes to uh, registers would need to be done by some kind of line of assembly. Uh, so there's like a more concise way to write the C code. Uh, does it correspond to the, there necessarily being a more concise way to write the assembly code as well? Uh, or do we not necessarily, can we not necessarily squeeze the assembly down? Yeah, so we could kind of do uh, P equal P plus equals I and then return star p and not bother with a temporary variable. That would be equivalent C code. Uh, however, we still need to get the value of p into RAX after we have changed it. And I mean, in that case, there is there is not a way to condense this assembly. Um, and this is, now what I was going to have by saying, there's going to be many different versions of the C code that would compile them to the same assembly. Um, and you would also change this asset. You could add more instructions to the assembly, certainly, to get a, a kind of equivalent program. All right, let's practice going the other direction. So I have a, a function arith that's going to do some arithmetic. It's going to take three longs um, as arguments. Uh, so, uh, 
RDX is the register that gets used for the third argument to a function. So RDX is what will store Z here. And then Uh, variable t1 going to be x plus y. A variable t2 z plus t1. A variable t3 x plus 4. And then I'm going to return t2 times uh, so this is the C code that uh, you're now going to work on uh, generating assembly uh, to compute this. Um, even more so than the last example, lots of different kind of versions of assembly can, uh, can generate this, uh, this code. So uh, if you are looking for some guidance to get started, uh, think of using two AIQ instructions, an LEA Q instruction, a multiplication instruction, and a return instruction. So this is sort of one way to approach it using these five, but there are many others you could explore. Yes. Are we only allowed to use this for uh, registers? Uh, no, you are free to use any of the 16. Uh, so the, the, uh, there is one of the 16 registers that is reserved for like these purposes. These are sort of conventions. Like on x86, Rx is used for the return value, but there's nothing about the architecture of x86 that says you must do this. The architecture of x86 says the register RSP is the stack pointer, which is how the system is going to keep track of memory on the stack. And so we cannot use RSP for like temporary variables and whatnot. Uh, but the rest, you are able to. So, um, go ahead and, and uh, work with your neighbors on coming up with assembly for this function. Let's walk through together how we might turn this into assembly. Um, who, who can show us the, the, the first thing uh, you uh, thought of doing for Compiling this to assembly. Uh, add Q, uh, add the register RDI to RSI. Yeah, this will take our first two parameters, X and Y, add them together. Uh, and we're using RSI as the destination, so we're we're overwriting RSI. Why is turns out that's not going to be a problem. Why why is that? Like that? Because you're copying by uh, value, which we're like function call. Um, yeah, so if y is some variable in some other function, we're not going to affect that. But also like within this, like there's, yeah, Connor? Uh, I'm doing this because you don't use Y again. Exactly. Like, this is the only operation that uses Y. And so it's actually, this is something the C compiler will try and do. It will be analyzing the code to say, all right, after this point, this function doesn't need this value Y anymore. So now RSI is kind of a free register. It can use it to store whatever value is convenient, in this case, T1 is now in RSI. All right, how about the next step? What might happen next? Uh, like this? Uh, yeah, this 
Yeah, so this is going to put T2 into RDX. We don't need Z anymore. Uh, so uh, it's fine if we, we overwrite RDX. Um, that looks good. How about another step after this? Mm -hmm. um, you could add Q and then four to add the I. And it's important that it's dollar sign four. If the if it's the assembly without the dollar sign, it tries to get the thing at memory address four to add, and that's that's going to be a segmentation fault. So we're uh, overwriting X at X plus four. That's fine. We don't need X after we do that. Um, what uh, what's what's the next step for our assembly? <laughs> Anders? Uh, well, so I'm all. We're multiplying our T2 times our T3, storing that in RDI. Uh, at this point, are we ready to return? Why not? Okay. Yes, exactly. That we haven't put our return value into REX at this point. So we need the result of this multiplication to be uh, to be in REX. So to finish out this one, we could move the product that we want to return into RAX. Now we're kind of finished uh, and can return. Fine. Um, and just just like RSP is reserved, when it returns, does it always return RAX? So this is something that's uh, a little hard to wrap our heads around. Um, the caller of a RIS will always assume that the return value has been put in RAX. So that's just a slightly different way of thinking about it than RAX is, is returned by the function. It's whatever happens to be in RAX when the function returns gets treated as the return value because the caller will use the value in that register. Um, so, uh, but for example, if a function has a void return type or its return value is not used by whoever calls it, then sort of what's in REX doesn't matter. Um, so that's sort of why I separate REX is kind of conventionally used for the return value by kind of. Uh, um, so if the C compiler works differently, it could use some other register for. Uh, the return value, uh, but uh, by convention we use RA. Yeah. Then would you then, for the event, specify a return like the different register? Um, the RX as the return value is an agreement between the function that is being called and the function that's called. They are agreeing that RAX will be used for the return value. Um, because it's just whatever register the caller looks for the return value in is the one that is the return value. So they could agree to use a different register. Um, that's not how that that's not how C, the the C compilers currently work, but they could agree uh, to use a, a different one. Using RSP as the the stack pointer, there are kind of uh, I believe there are parts of the hardware that assume that this register is used to keep track of stack memory. And so the compiler couldn't just sort of have the program agree to use a different register for that. Other question, Kevin? Um, regarding the uh, 
Yeah, so what uh, what the C compiler will do with this function is use LEA at this point to kind of do these two steps kind of in one go. If we wanted to add uh, RSI and RDX, And this memory operand adds these two registers together, and then we can store that in RAX. And now, when we do this multiplication, we can use RAX as T2 and store the result there, so that the multiplication results are already in RAX, uh, and we don't need a separate instruction to move it there. So LEA is letting us do both an addition and have a kind of separate destination from the two registers we're adding together, which add Q uh, does not allow us to do. Does that make sense? Does it? Um, can the first two also be converted into the uh, These two? Yeah. Um, because it's like moving it into RDI, and then it's like adding that, so it's just adding three things, and can't LEA do that? Uh, so the, you're thinking, can we put the, the third register right here? Uh, the, the displacement must be an integer constant, okay. so we can't put a register outside, but if we could, yeah, then we could kind of combine all that together. Any other questions? All right. All right. I have a few uh, firsts for you. Uh, so here we have John Tyler. Uh, you may recall this is our, our first vice president to assume. Uh, uh, office after a president died, that was uh, William Henry Harrison. Uh, John Tyler's opponents would refer to him as his accidency or the accidental president. Um, here's uh, here's a, a his kind of official presidential portrait. And uh, Harrison, member of the Whig Party. Uh, powerful uh, Whigs in Congress, particularly Henry Clay, had just assumed that uh, they would be the kind of power behind the scenes when Harrison was in office. Uh, also kind of assumed it would work that way with Tyler, uh, but it turned out that even though Tyler was the vice president for uh, uh, the Whig party, uh, his political views were different than the Whig views on many important issues. Um, and so uh, uh, he and, and, and Congress were uh, bitterly uh, divided. He was the first president uh, to face impeachment proceedings in the House. Um, uh, uh, representatives were, were grumpy enough that uh, they, they held some hearings, did not actually go so far to, as to impeach him. Um, he was also the first president to have uh, a veto overridden by Congress. Uh, this was actually in the last month of his presidency. Congress overrode his veto on a very minor piece of legislation, but uh, I, I think emblematic of how little they got along. Uh, big issue of the day, uh, of course, was slavery and the expansion of slavery into uh, on, uh, new states. Uh, one of those new states was uh, Texas, which had uh, at this time broken uh, uh, away from Mexico, and there were people in the U.S. that really wanted to annex Texas, and people that didn't, and people that wanted Texas to be, uh, to allow slavery if it were a state, and some people that didn't. Um, and 
this became a big, a big political issue. Tyler was uh, very pro-slavery, pro-states rights, uh, and many of the Whigs were not. Um, here is a, a picture of Tyler kind of later uh, in life uh, uh, during the, the Civil War when he sided with the Confederacy and served in the Confederate government. Um, some uh, kind of less uh, uh, non-presidential firsts during this time period. Uh, we had the first US postage issued 1847 uh, featuring Ben Franklin and George Washington. Uh, and also the first college to admit uh, women, Oberlin College, um, is the first women in 1837. Um, uh, also one of the first colleges uh, in, in Ohio. Uh, also one of the first colleges to uh, uh, enroll African Americans. Uh, Carleton, when it was founded several decades later, uh, uh, I guess Oberlin was, uh, did this just a few years after it was founded, Carleton. Uh, admitted uh, women from uh, the start of its founding in the 1870s. All right, so there are some, some firsts uh, for today. So now let's talk about uh, jumping around in code. So When in a C program or uh, or any other programming language, uh, uh, we're familiar with the idea of a conditional statement, where there's some property of the system or of the world, and that's going to determine whether we do kind of go down one path or not. But in order to do anything like this, whether it's a conditional, a loop, a function call, anything where we're not just kind of going one line of code at a time, always just executing the very next thing, we need some way to change what the next instruction that is going to execute. So how does the system kind of know what instruction to execute? There is a special register called the instruction pointer, and its abbreviation is appropriately RID. And this holds. the address of the next instruction that we'll execute. So we're executing uh, instruction A, and then the instruction that we execute after that is whatever uh, instruction is at the address that is stored in RIP. And Every time we go and kind of fetch and execute the next instruction, the address in RIP is automatically updated to kind of be the next instruction, just kind of going one after the other, uh, going down. And so to do something like an if, we need to be able to control the address in this register so that we can control, is the next instruction the one here, or is it the one in the else case? Kind of changing the address in RIP kind of changes whether the next instruction will be in these two branches. I see. By address, do you mean like memory address? I do mean memory address. So is like the code put into like the memory? 
Yes, this is uh, an excellent point that uh, if we think about a program's memory and we think about kind of low the very lowest address up to the very highest address that a pro uh, in a program's memory. Uh, there's actually specific regions of this memory that are used for different things. And we'll come back to, to this in more detail uh, in the future. But the stack is, stuff on the stack is stored at high addresses. Stuff that's on the heap that we get through malloc, that's in kind of these middle addresses. And down at the low addresses is indeed the code that this program is running. And so all the instructions we're running are actually in memory, and they're kind of being uh, sent over to the CPU uh, as the program runs. Scott? So like each line of the code there is storing a byte? Uh, or so like, like, no, no, it's not a byte, but like one memory address that is represented by a byte? Or like whatever it is? Yeah, so we'll actually see, uh, see an example uh, of this today or, or Monday, depending on time. but. Uh, x86 is what's called a variable length encoding, which means each instruction uses a variable number of bytes. So like between one and six. I'm not sure what the maximum is, but uh, in that range. Um, and so yes, each instruction will be at a particular address, and then when one is kind of fetched and executed, RIP is updated to kind of some number of bytes uh, uh, up in memory to kind of be the next instruction. Other questions? All right. So we need to control kind of what uh, uh, what this instruction pointer is, and we're going to do that via. jump instructions. And there are three kinds of jump instructions. There are direct and indirect, which both use this, uh, the instruction JMP, uh, followed by, for direct, a literal memory address, for indirect, uh, either a memory address or uh, a register. Uh, we will come back to these direct and indirect types kind of when they become kind of applicable to some thing that we want to, to explore. Uh, but for now, we're going to focus on the third type, which is conditional counts. Something that says, uh, if a certain condition is met, it is met then change the instruction pointer to this address. Otherwise, we don't. So there's a big table of these on the reference sheet. Uh, and they have names like JE for jump when equal, or J, uh, JLE for less than or equal. Uh, and there are kind of all the, the different sorts of uh, uh, Boolean uh, conditions that you might want to express. But you may be wondering jump equal, jump when equal to, to what? Like, what, what are we checking the equality of? And the way that this works is that these jump instructions, a, uh, the way that x86 is designed, we don't have an instruction that both performs a comparison and does a jump. These, these two kind of uh, uh, pieces of, of implementing conditional behavior are kind of broken into two different instructions. Um, 
So we have the jump instructions that uh, are These conditional jump instructions, their behavior is determined by the result of the most recent arithmetic instruction. Fine. So if you if we had for like example that that add queue thing that we pop into RDI, it will look at RDI? So, uh, uh, it will not look at the value of RDI. What will happen is that every arithmetic instruction is going to Set these specific flags, these specific uh, uh, individual bits that can either be one or zero, called condition codes. And these are kind of set based on whatever the result of that uh, instruction was. So uh, there are kind of four four different of these condition codes that are used to uh, implement the, the set of conditional jumps. We have CF, or the carry flag, that is going to be set to 1 if the arithmetic operation kind of had a bit kind of carry out kind of past, the, past the end. So uh, if you uh, if we were talking about four bits and we added kind of eight and eight, that would give us 16. This is kind of one carried out of our four bits. And so the carry flag would be set so that the system kind of knew that a carry out happened. There's uh, a zero flag that set if the result was zero. There's a sign flag, which is set if the result is negative. And there's an overflow flag that's set if there was uh, overflow, if there was two's complement overflow, which basically means the signs of the two inputs were the same, and the sign of the output is different than that. So, this is the way that these different conditions are actually uh, implemented in the system. And the figures that the reading for today kind of directs you to review from the textbook, they show the kind of bitwise expressions involving these different condition codes that tell you like equal or less than equal uh, and all these different things. So this is how it actually works. Unfortunately, how it actually works is deeply unintuitive. Like, we're not used to thinking about, oh, equal means that the zero flag is set, uh, uh, and things like this. So that is why I kind of provide you with this, uh, the, the table that's in the reference sheet, uh, where when we have, say, um, uh, and add Q instruction with a source and a destination followed by a jump equal, we can look in that table and see, okay, jump equal will jump if 
the result of this operation, basically if adding these two together resulted in zero. And so I'm using um, I'm using this table to translate these jumps into the actual kind of uh, uh, Boolean relations that we're used to thinking of uh, is going to make understanding this kind of conditional assumption code a lot easier than trying to reason purely in terms of, oh, all right, which condition codes are set and which combination of them uh, uh, mean these different, these different uh, uh, conditional steps. So this is fairly abstract, so I'd like to uh, show a particular uh, example. Here I have uh, a function to compute the absolute value of the difference between two numbers. And so it just checks to see which number is larger and then does the subtraction to kind of get the positive uh, 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 result of, of the difference. So absolute value of the difference. And so looking at the assembly, we see what is a common pattern where we have this compare Q instruction. This compare instruction is uh, a kind of special kind of arithmetic operation. Uh, it does the second operand minus the first, but throws away the result. So it's a way of performing an arithmetic operation between the operands setting the condition code based on the outcome of that operation, but not storing the result anywhere because we don't actually care about the result. We care about this side effect of performing this arithmetic operation that is going to tell us something about the relative values of the two operands. So we have the two parameters, x and y, stored in RSI and RDI. So we compare them, and then we see JLE for jump less than or equal to. And if we look at the table on the reference sheet, JLE, look over to the column under compare, the rightmost column, and we see B less than or equal to A, which is to say that this will jump to location L2, dot L2, this label down here. So it's going to jump down here to L2 if RDI is less than or equal to RSI. Uh, and then if it doesn't jump, well then our RIP, our instruction pointer, is just stays unchanged and moves on to the next instruction after the jump. Because it's automatically going to go to the next instruction unless the jump changes it to go to somewhere else. Um, and so if it's jumping if it's less than or equal to, so that's this case down here, since else will happen when uh, uh, x is less than or equal to y, and it's just doing a move and, and subtract, and it does the move and subtract kind of with the operands flipped in the other case, and then another case returns. Uh, so we'll see a lot more about how kind of different sorts of conditional behavior and loops get turned into assembly using these uh, comparing conditional jumps. Uh, that's all the time we have for now. Uh, so uh, remember to make a uh, check-in post for lab one. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you Monday. Thank you.